Good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield. I lead River Church and I'm uh, grateful that you are inviting me into your home today. We are continuing to produce these sermon videos because we know that, that while we are meeting publicly again as a church, some of you are still uh, stay, uh, staying home and self-isolating and we we respect that. I, I encourage you to follow your conscience. And so we're doing this each and every week, putting in the time and effort because we want to include you and make you a part of uh, the life and work of the church as best we can during this, this pandemic. Um, we're about to get rolling on worship, so I invite you to get rid of your distractions, fill up your coffee cup, uh, get a Bible, something to write with, notepad, and uh, in just a minute, we'll get, we'll get rolling. One, one thing, if you have questions about River Church, uh, maybe there's some information you're looking for, uh, you can go to our website, uh, riverchurchrgv.com, and all things River Church can be found there. Well, we're going to be talking about gospel communities, our small groups, and some of them meet online virtually. So if you're still self-isolating, I encourage you to send us an email and get connected at least virtually with a small group. Also, many of us are reading through the Bible this year. I'm using the Daily Walk Bible, but you can find a number of different resources that you can use that will walk you through the Bible in a year, different reading plans. Uh, you can also get an electronic version of the Daily Walk Bible, or you can get your own print copy. It's not too late to get started on reading the Bible. Uh, we're, you know, about 10 days into it, but you can just catch up on that reading, and then you'll be right on, uh, on schedule with the rest of us. So, so uh, be thinking about that. Go online and check out uh, our website, and we'll get rolling with worship here in just a second. With the turning of the calendar and the beginning of 2021, we as a church are, are on this new journey to see every one of us more deeply connected in relationship. Uh, be that a, a, a small group, a, a Bible study, a cell group. Uh, here at River Church, we call them gospel communities. Uh, we, we, we're on this journey together to be more deeply connected and committed and, and relational on a small group level than we've ever been in the past. And so we're seeing that happen. Uh, just this past Wednesday, just a few days ago, right here at the church, uh, my men's group met. There are about 10 of us total, and we are we're reading through the Bible together uh, this year. On a, on a weekly basis, we're going to meet and encourage one another as we, as we tackle the, the, this, this challenge of reading the whole Bible in one year. Uh, next week, Priscilla and Lydia are beginning this, this ladies' Bible study, and, and they as well are, are, are studying uh, this earnest uh, desire to, to, to understand God's Word and to, to, to study it, uh, the entire Bible, in one year. And, and, and so it seems as though the Holy Spirit is moving at River Church. It's kind of like this wave, and the Holy Spirit is moving, and what He is doing in our hearts collectively. Many of us want to know God's Word this year, and we want to, to get through the entirety of, of, of the Bible in a year. And so, so if that's like a wave, the Holy Spirit moving here, if that's like a wave, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing here at River Church, then I want to ride that wave. I want to jump on that wave and, 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 and be a part of that. So in an effort to, to, to ride that wave, to, to align myself, what it seems the Holy Spirit is already doing here at River Church this year, I've decided that, that, that I will preach a year's worth of sermons in that direction. So the, the sermon, the theme for the year, uh, this sermon series is called The Great Exchange, A Walk Through the Stories of the Bible. The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. And so we're going to be doing that all year. As, as we individually are reading through the Bible, I'm going to be every week preaching through this, this same theme. Now, this title, The Great Exchange, <clears throat> it's a phrase uh, that I use often to describe the story of the Bible. Maybe you have this understanding uh, that, that, that the Bible is just a a collection of uh, many and various historical uh, stories that don't necessarily fit together, just this, this hodgepodge collection of stories. And, and what I want to introduce you to this year is the fact that, that the Bible is actually one great 
story, the story of God's interaction with humanity, and I call it the great exchange. The great exchange. I remember a great exchange when I was uh, about 19, 20 years old. You see, I was driving uh, this 1978 Camaro, and it was a fast car, and it had been a cool car, uh, but now I was a college student, and I was driving, <clears throat> you know, 600 miles back and forth uh, uh, several times a year to, to get to college and get back here to, to Brownsville, and the car wasn't cool anymore, and the car was kind of broke down uh, because it wasn't 1978 anymore. It was 1989. And so what happened was I had this broke-down Camaro, and my dad took that car. My father took that car, and in its place, he gave me a 1989 Chevy pickup. And that was a great exchange. That, that really worked out for me. Uh, it really benefited me, that great exchange. The story of the Bible is the great exchange, that, that, that all we have, uh, you know, is, is sin and, and brokenness. It's just how I was born. It's just, it's just the nature of who I am. And all that Jesus has is righteousness and perfection. And the great exchange happens, and I'm the beneficiary. 2 Corinthians 5 says it this way, For our sake, he, God, made him Jesus. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the great exchange. That is the story of the Bible. We need righteousness. I need righteousness to be acceptable in God's eyes because he's holy and he's perfect. And in order for me to move into his presence, I, can't, I, can't, I need his righteousness. But I don't have it. I don't have it. And what I have is sin and brokenness. And so God has what I need and I don't deserve, and that's righteousness. It, and I have what God hates and rejects, and that's sin. And so what does God do? What is his answer to the situation? And his answer is Jesus Christ. Uh, the answer, Jesus Christ. The answer is the great exchange. Jesus died in my place, and he bore all of the condemnation that, that, that was rightly aimed at me. All of the punishment, all the condemnation that, that was aimed at my sin and my condition, Jesus took that on. And, and then I took on his righteousness as a result. And so that is the great exchange. That is the story of the Bible. That is God's interaction with humankind. So God looks at us and he sees the righteousness of Christ now. On that day of Christ's crucifixion, God looked at Christ on the cross, and he saw our sin. Now, some people say, regarding the, the, the human condition, regarding the, just the, 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 the state of our world, um, the sad state of our broken world, this earth, this globe that we live on, uh, so, some people say that, that, that God, in interacting with the world, <clears throat> He is either completely good, loving heart, compassionate, completely good, but he's, he's not that powerful. Or, or he is all-powerful, but he's not that good. But he can't be both. Some would say he cannot be both completely good and, and, and all-powerful, because how could a good and all-powerful God allow such brokenness in the world to exist? I don't see it that way. See, the great exchange explains all of that. Christ, God, God the Son in, in heaven, all the glory, all the comfort, Christ exchanged the glory of heaven for the burdens of this worldly existence. He didn't have to. 
But he looked on the brokenness that you and I experience. He looked on the sadness and the sorrow of the world. And he didn't turn an uncaring eye. He didn't, he didn't cast a glance away, not able to look at it anymore. No, he, he looked right at it. And what was his response? God looked at the suffering of humanity and he decided to engage in our suffering, to get right in the middle of it. Christ's words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A question that we cannot completely answer or, or even comprehend, but we can celebrate, we can be thankful for. That, that, that God the Father forsook God the Son on the cross that he might not forsake us. And that is the gospel. That is the great exchange. Our sins are laid on Christ and his righteousness is laid on us. And, and that is the great exchange. So, so, so that he might exchange our guilt for his righteousness, that is the story of Jesus in a nutshell. Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Just last night I was reading a book and and there was, there was the, uh, a, a dear but misunderstood person who, who thought that he must account for and ask forgiveness for every single sin that he had ever committed, else he would go to hell. And that if he, if he sinned one time uh, and then died immediately, he would go to hell for that one final sin. And what I want you to understand is you don't work for your salvation. You, you don't accomplish your own forgiveness. It is a gift, a free gift from God that you simply receive. But the great exchange that I speak of today is not just found late in the Bible. Else this would be a really short sermon series. It is not just in the stories of Jesus and the gospel or the book of Revelation. No, it is all over the pages of every section of the Bible, every chapter of, of every book of the entire Bible, we see the story, the great exchange. And that is what I want to show you this year. So I'm looking forward to 12 months of celebrating the goodness of God and finding the great exchange in each and every nook and cranny of the stories of the Bible. <laughs> And, a, and a, a beautiful implication of this, of this great exchange, like, like if, if, if this great exchange is really true, that God cared so much about the brokenness of humanity, humanity that he entered into our brokenness and he took on our sin so that we might take on his righteousness. If that is true, if God does this, if he is willing to do this, the great exchange, then if he's willing to do that for his children, then, then here's the big question. Is there anything that he won't do for us? Romans 8 says it this way. He, that is God, <clears throat> he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, like he did that, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The point is, if God is able and willing to do the big thing, and that is give up his son that we might be saved, won't he also make good on every other promise? He's able. That's easy compared to what he's already done. This is the truth on which all other truths rely, on which all other truths are staked. God has saved us from sin and death. And now he's going to make good on all the promises of the Bible in our lives for eternity. If he's able to do the hard thing, that is the, our salvation through the Christ's death on the cross, isn't he able to do 
the comparatively easy thing, and that is make good on all of his promises for eternity. So, we um, will see all of this unfold week after week for this entire year, and I'm looking forward to it. All right, let's jump right in. Week number one. Today we're talking about creation because that's the beginning of the Bible. Uh, that's where uh, we, the, the men's Bible, so that's where we've been. Um, I encourage you to, to find your own reading plan if you're not in one of these groups I've talked about and, and, and you uh, perhaps want to join us in, in reading through the Bible yourself. It's not too late. You're just about a week late. Just catch up on some reading and you'll be there. Uh, but, but this week, week one, creation, the, 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 the God created ex nihilo out of nothing, ex nihilo, that's out of nothing God created in seven great acts he breathed god spoke all that exists into existence you've probably read the creation story on day one god created on day two god created out of nothing he spoke it into existence <clears throat> and, and 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 he created at that in that, in that series of events, he created two real, live human beings, historical figures, Adam and Eve. He created Adam and Eve to live in his presence, to, to walk in the garden with him and to relate. And he gave them one command, one instruction. Imagine that, just one instruction. And it was to not eat of this certain tree, but what it really was was, trust me. Tr trust me on this. That one command, simply trust me. A and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. So he created Adam and Eve. And in and, and Genesis 2, it's still, it's still uh, post the tragic event. Uh, Genesis 2, it says this, Then the man said, upon seeing Eve, upon seeing his wife, the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were naked and were not ashamed. They were naked. They were not ashamed. They, they walked in the garden regularly with God himself. They, they related to him face to face. He knew them. They knew him. And there was no separation. There was no division. There was no want. There was no hurt. There was no shame. But then the story goes on. As you know, Satan comes to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent, and, and he tests them, or he tempts them, rather. He, he says, did God really say that? Did God really tell you that, that, that you, you shouldn't eat from the tree, that that, that that would be bad for you, that, 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 that you would die. He said, God's holding out on you. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. It's just a power struggle. God just doesn't want the best for you. He's holding out on you. It's a familiar lie. We... We struggle with the same lie to this day. Is God really good? Is God really holding out on me? Why doesn't he want me to eat from that tree? Drink from that water source? So they believe the lie like we at times do. They, they believed it. God, God must be holding out on us. And so they, they did the thing. 
And in Genesis 3, it says this, And they, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They knew that sound. It had become familiar to them. But now everything had changed. Now everything was different. They heard God walking. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he, Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? For the first time ever, Adam and Eve realize their nakedness and they feel shame before the Lord. Verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of of all, the live, of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The word of the Lord. This is the first great exchange of the Bible. The most beautiful first act of exchange, God interacting with humanity. Now, now it's a small picture of the, the, the greatest exchange that has ever taken place, and that's Jesus' righteousness for my sin. But this picture, this exchange in this Genesis story, it is a, a, a foreshadowing. It is a picture of how God will one day totally make right of every wrong. It is a picture, a window into God's heart, how he feels about our shame. We have this idea that, that, man, and, that, that the man sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, and, and, and God's first response was, was harsh and, and judgmental and exclusionary. And that's not the case. His first response was to cover their shame. He, he looked at his dear, dear children who had, who, had, who had never experienced shame before, and all of a sudden they were just marked by shame, and, and it broke his heart. It broke his heart that Adam and Eve felt shame for the first time. So he, he covered it. Now, it, it, was, it was the first exchange. It wasn't the greatest exchange, but, but he, covered. He, knew they were, he knew they were shame, ashamed of their nakedness, so he, he killed an animal, I suppose, and he took the, 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 uh, the pelt and he made them clothes. He didn't want them to be ashamed. Now, now yes, they were naked, literally, and had never felt that shame before, but but it goes much deeper into the human soul, the sense of, of shame that we, that we carry that, that, that causes us to, to run from God, to say, I can never be in the presence of God. And, and it, it causes us to separate relationally and say, I can never trust my, my wife. I can never trust my husband. I can never trust my friends. There's too much shame. I must cover. I must hide. I must get away. I cannot reveal to you the, 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 the true me. Hey, you, you, you would laugh at me. You would judge me. There's this shame, and, and God, it breaks God's heart. He, 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 when I see my children feeling shame, it, it breaks my heart and, and exponentially, uh, in an exponentially greater way. God's heart breaks. He does not want us to be a people of shame. He, do, he is not a, a judgmental, exclusionary, harsh 
God. His first human response to our shame is he wants to, he wants to make it better. He looked at Adam and Eve. His, his, his heart was broken over how ashamed they felt. And, and he, just, he just had to do something about it. Now he's going to do something much, much more extreme as the Bible unfolds and we, and we ultimately arrive at the cross. But, but at this moment in time, he had to do something about it. He had to deal with the shame. Does that covering of shame sound familiar to you? In that moment in time, God sheds the innocent blood of an animal to cover their shame. Uh, now, this was just a temporary covering. Ultimately, Jesus came to earth to deal with our shame permanently, to cover our shame permanently with his blood, to provide true release from our sin, true relief from our shame. <coughs> Do you feel shame today? <coughs> Maybe you feel like a failure. You wouldn't admit it to anyone because you're too ashamed. But maybe you feel like you've never really lived up to your potential. Maybe you feel the shame of your sin. Maybe incarceration. Perhaps you've been to prison. Maybe a lack of education and you just don't feel very smart. You feel like the smallest person in the room. Maybe a speech dif uh, difficulty. Uh, a disorder of so, some sort. Maybe you have a shameful past. Maybe you've been abused. Perhaps you have abused someone else. God wants to cover your shame this morning. He wants to cover it not, not with the skin of an animal. He wants to cover your shame with the blood of Jesus. He wants to perform in your life the great exchange. He wants to exchange your shame for the righteousness of Christ. At the root, at the core, at the very center of our being, many of us have carried shame all of our lives. We want to cover it up. We want to hide it. We want to hide from, hide from God when he comes around. Maybe you've been running from God for a long time. Maybe you even as a Christian, you've been running from God. You, don't, you want to stay a distance away. You don't want to get too close because of your shame. <coughs> Sometimes I take a walk with God. I mean, I go on a walk. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes I take a walk with God, um, and, and I... I apologize. I apologize for my frailty and my faults. And I feel my heavenly father say, I hear his voice. I feel him say, child, don't apologize. I made you. And I am making all things new in you. I'm covering you with the blood of Christ. I see the righteousness of Christ in you. I have covered all your shame with Christ's work on the cross. And I see you in a new light, dear child. Don't apologize. I, I really do. I hear, I hear my Heavenly Father say that to me at times. And I want, to hear, I want you to hear that same voice. You know what does that? You know what that does to my soul when I hear, when I hear the Lord say that. It just, it just lifts my spirit. It causes me to love Jesus all the more. It causes me to be all the more enamored by Christ's work on the cross. It 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 lifts my soul when the when when the Lord says to me. What I see in you is the righteousness of Christ. No no shame. I see in you the righteousness of Christ. Um, you know, we can't love Jesus enough. 
We, we, we just can't make a big enough deal about Jesus. We, we can't, we could just go on and on forever and never stop. The story of Jesus, the story of the Bible, is the story of the great exchange. My sin placed on Christ and the righteousness of Christ placed on me. Oh, dear friends, we are not, we are not called to, to try harder and, and to do better and to work more. We are called to believe. We are called to rest in Christ. We are called to place our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is the story of the Bible. It's called justification by faith. You and I were justified by our faith, not by our works, not by trying to clean ourselves up. I could work for the rest of my life to, to clean myself up, and, and, I, and I still wouldn't accomplish it. But Christ did that work on the cross once and for all. Romans 4 says this, And to the one who does not work, in other words, working for your salvation, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. It's made clear. You don't have to work for your righteousness. You don't have to, to perform a bunch of good works and, and, and service and, and a life of, of good deeds to, 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 to accomplish your righteousness. You'll never accomplish righteousness that way. It says for the person who, who doesn't work for his salvation but believes, puts his faith in the one who justifies, puts his faith in Christ, his faith is counted as righteousness. You were righteous. The righteousness of Christ has been placed on you. If you were in Christ, you are a new creation. The old things, they have passed away. They have, have died. Your past is dead. You are a new creation in Christ. That is the great exchange. So I look forward over the next 12 months to to story by story, finding this unified theme, the great exchange in the entire Bible. Dear friends, I'll close with this. Your true family identity now is you're a child of God. The gospel story, the story of Jesus Christ on the cross, it brings freedom. Freedom from guilt. And freedom from shame. And, and fear. And judgment. C come to Jesus today. Come to him for this great exchange. That you might, that you might give him your shame, your guilt, your fear, judgment, and you might take on his righteousness. Come to Jesus and believe. Okay, well, that's a wrap. Um, it's, so been, it's been so good to be with you today. Again, I'm honored that you invited me into your home. Uh, I, I feel like uh, this is the best we can do right now to worship together, at least virtually, until things get back to normal. Listen, if you have a need, if you have a hurt, if you have a question, uh, if you need someone to reach out to you, would you just send me an email? And we, the elders at River Church, we will, we will help you in any way we can. Uh, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Randy at riverchurchrgv.com. If you want to get connected, send us an email and we'll get you connected with a virtual gospel community. Um, and now would be a good time to go online and give. Everything that we do here at River Church, the ministry at River Church, it is funded by your generosity, your good gifts. So I encourage you to go to the website and give electronically. Uh, <laughs> electronically. Uh, it's, it's simple, it's safe, uh, it's intuitive. Uh, many of you have been doing that, and I, I really appreciate your generosity. It's, it's how we've continued to maintain this ministry. 
uh, during the last 12 months. So love you guys. Uh, I really am praying for you guys by name. If you have a prayer request, send me an email and I will, I'll put you on my prayer list. Um, you enjoy the rest of your day.